everybody, and uh, welcome to this afternoon's MST African Mining and Energy Forum. Uh, thank you for everybody for registering and coming along today. We've got a very, very interesting afternoon of, of companies from various parts of Africa to present and across various commodities. Just want to start, I'm Michael Bentley. Uh, I'm uh, with the MST Access Mining and Energy Research Team. Uh, and I just wanted to start off with a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, you're most welcome to submit questions. And if you'd like to do that, please do that via the Q&A box down. You'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just type in the question there, and then it, when the speakers have ended up uh, with end of their presentation, I will go through the questions uh, to to the speakers. If we don't happen to get through all the questions, we'll make sure that the speakers get those questions, and we can get some answers back to you. But well, let, without further ado, let's get on with uh, with it. And Ionic Rare Earths is our first presenter. Tim Harrison's the CEO there. Tim's a very busy man at the moment. He's got plenty on it uh, with Ionic Rare Earths with his uh, his flagship Makutu Rare Earth project, project there in Uganda, as well as some exciting recycling uh, options he's looking within the company as well. Uh, so, look, that, that, that's enough from here from me. I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and uh, he's going to tell you all about it. So welcome today, Tim. It's great to have you here, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so Ionic Rare Earths, we're looking at developing uh, magnet and heavy rare earths uh, for the new economy. Just our, our disclaimer. Um, so with regards to, to the business, uh, we're developing, uh, as Michael indicated, the Makutu Rare Earth Project, which is a magnet uh, and heavy rare earth dominant ionic absorption clay project. Um, we're developing that as a primary source. Uh, looking at the potential for, for refining and separating the rare earths into the individual products to go into energy transition, advanced manufacturing and defence, uh, and complementing that with the ability to bring on um, secondary magnet rare earths through recycling. Focus of the business, and, and really just to give a, a very high level um, overview of, of the demand in the rare earth space, it's driven by magnet rare earths. Magnet rare earths specifically are four elements that go into the production of, um, of permanent magnets that are used in uh, the energy transition, whether that be uh, electric vehicles or, or offshore wind, for, to, to name a couple of our applications. Uh, neodymium, praseodymium are uh, two light rare earth magnet, rare, uh, two light uh, magnet rare earths. They typically come from hard rock projects. But our main focus is the dysprosium and the terbium. Um, these are two elements that come from ionic adsorption clays prevalent in southern China and Myanmar. Uh, and those mines in, in southern China and Myanmar today represent about 98% of the world's dysprosium and terbium production. Uh, importantly, both dysprosium and terbium are required for the development of sintered magnets to go into high temperature applications in electric vehicles and offshore wind. Um, a quick overview snapshot of the business, um, you know, market cap is approximately $89 million. Uh, at the end of September, we had $5 million in the bank. We've just completed a, another $5.9 million capital raise. Uh, and so with the funds on hand, we're able to now move through a couple of uh, key activities across the, the Makuchi project and also our recycling business and positioning the, the, the company for... Uh, the re rate. Uh, if we look at the Lasson curve there on the right, um, our share price tends to, to follow very closely with the neodymium price. Um, and so we expect uh, to continue to deliver on uh, the execution of both projects into uh, what we expect will be a, a rebounding rare earth price in 2024. Um, from the geopolitical aspect, um, and, and this is a, a key driver in what's happening with rare earths globally, um, you know. Case in point is, is the European Critical Raw Material Act. This is an act that's looking at establishing or helping to establish um, uh, alternative supply chains uh, from the existing supply chain. Um, and so we do see a, a significant opportunity now for the company to, to look at positioning in, in the EU and the US, for example, whereby onshoring of process capacity, um, decoupling and bifurcation of the supply chain becoming increasingly important. Um, if we look at the EU Critical Raw Material Act in, in uh, a little bit more detail, the EU is aim, aiming on having 40% of its refining capacity established in, in Europe uh, to, uh, to supply the markets there by 2030. 
and approximately 24, 25% of the magnet rare earth supply chain coming from recycling by the end of this decade. So they're two real big drivers that we see um, ionic rare earth being able to dovetail quite nicely into. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we've got the mine at one end, supply and primary, um, magnet and heavy rare earths. We own 60% of Makutu at the moment. We're working through a mining license application. We're building a demonstration plant now, um, planning on producing mixed rare earth carbonate in the first quarter of next year. At the other end of the supply chain on recycling, we are currently producing separated high purity magnet rare earths. And through the, the availability of that product, being able to progress some, some key relationships, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Just on Makuta itself, um, so it's a large iron consortium clay project, and we do have the Ugandan government support being granted flagship project status in 2022. Um, the project location, we're 120 kilometres east of Kampala, extremely well serviced by infrastructure. Uh, there's approximately 800 megawatts of installed hydroelectric power within 60 kilometres of site, and we have immediate access to road and rail with a 132 kV transmission line exporting power out to Kenya through, uh, through our tenements. We announced a feasibility study earlier this year on the first of six tenements, so the central Makutu licence where we've applied for the mining licence. That DFS um, defined a 35-year mine life uh, with the potential for, for further expansion, uh, capital development of 121 million, and an IRR of approximately 33%. Um, importantly, what differentiates Makutu from a number of other rare earth projects is the dominant uh, proportion of both magnet and heavy rare earths in our basket. At 71%, it's one of the leading projects globally um, that can bring on new supply of, of magnet and heavy rare earths external to the existing supply chain from China. And therefore, we do see the, the project having significant geopolitical tailwinds in the bifurcation of the supply chain. We're building the demonstration plant at the moment um, at Makutu. Um, we expect to have the, all of the equipment installed later this year and first mixed rare earth carbonate in the first quarter of 2024. Um, the de demonstration plant will, will focus on two phases. The first phase being heat bleach columns and cribs to in order uh, production of initial MREC for, for our supply chain partners. With the second phase being much larger heat bleach modules where we can start to produce significant quantities of mixed rare earth carbonate and parcels for those supply chains to evaluate at much larger capacity. When we look at the um, ironic consortium clays, and, and obviously there's been a lot of focus and a lot of growth in this uh, this area of the market or the supply chain over the course of the last 12 months, you know we've got the we've got a very advanced project. Um, the, the most advanced project is the Cerro Verde project, which is in um, ramp up at the moment, expecting first production this month. And uh, and uh, you know we we watch very closely the successes that that, that project will achieve. Importantly, that product has got its product committed to China uh, for the next 20 years from the first module. So any Western supply chain looking to develop um, alternatives um, on Chinese source heavy rare earths over the next few years, really um, we, we've got a, a significant advantage on time um, when we consider those other projects um, and driven by the, the need for those new supply chains to emerge over the next couple of years, we do see a great role from Makutu to fit into that supply chain. Over the next 12 months, um, we do expect a number of catalysts that help the, the project move forward. Um, we've been working with the Ugandan government on the mining license application. Uh, we've satisfied a number of obligations there. We've secured over 95% of the land access agreements for that 44 square kilometre tenement. And so we're expecting the award of the mining license shortly. Um, we completed some uh, the phase five drilling recently, which um, included both reconnaissance drilling and infill drilling. So we're expecting an updated um, exploration target shortly, um, and then in the first quarter of next year, an updated mineral resource estimate on the Makutu Western Zone, which will be the next area that will progress to a mining license. Um, on the back of the um, demonstration plant at Makutu producing mixed rare earth carbonate. Um, we will also be generating new information, which will go into an updated feasibility study. Um, and with those two things 
looking to position the project with an offtake uh, and, and, and being able to communicate where our product is likely to go into the new supply chains that are going to form um, and then being able to commit to the final investment decision in the second half of 2024. Just going to briefly also touch upon um, the recycling business, Ionic Technologies. So what we're in essence doing is we're taking end-of-life materials but also taking um, metals, um, swarf and, and, and other materials made in the production of magnets, taking them back to the elemental form, um, which then enables our, our supply chain partners uh, to be able to develop new magnets to go into high specification magnets for EV motors and wind turbines. We've already demonstrated the ability to produce high purity oxides at our demonstration plant in Belfast. Um, and that's been a, a key catalyst for us uh, with a lot of reverse inquiry coming to the business post the announcement of that high purity products we produced in June. We've announced uh, a number of uh, partnerships and, and uh, you know, further support from the UK government. Um, probably the most important one announced in September was that partnership with, uh, with Ford and Less Common Metals to, to develop um, and demonstrate what a UK domestic supply chain would look like. Um, and we're also working on a feasibility study to support commercial development in Belfast. We recently announced, uh, we held our opening for the facility in Belfast, um, whereby we're now working towards going to a 24-7 operation of that demonstration plant in the new year um, with a substantial amount of magnets already in, in inventory, being able to position Ionic Technologies as a leader in the recycling um, of, of magnet rare earths and, and a key enabler of that circular economy and recycled supply going into uh, into the European market. A little bit more about Belfast and why Belfast and Northern Ireland makes perfect sense for us. Um, you know, obviously extremely close proximity to Europe um, and given the geopolitical climate, a number of policies that are supporting uh, opportunity in, in Northern Ireland. Firstly, in the UK, um, we've got tremendous support from the UK government, coupled with the Windsor framework and their critical mineral strategy, we do see Belfast being a, a prime location for us to develop our first commercial uh, operation. Within the EU, and I mentioned this earlier, um, under that European Critical Raw Material Act, we do see 25% of the supply chain coming from recycling or, or targets and benchmarks the EU has set. 25% of the magnet rare earth supply chain to come from recycling by the end of this decade, which represents one in four units. Um, which is a significant increase on the previous 15%. And, uh, you know, we, we do see that being a, a huge opportunity for the business going forward. Just to provide a little bit more context about the Windsor Framework, the Windsor Framework, in essence, opens up an opportunity and dual market access for us to operate across both the EU and the UK. Um, and then the third aspect is... Is um, in development at the moment between the UK and the US. Uh, the Atlantic Declaration potentially opening up the opportunity for Inflation Reduction Act um, funds to be uh, supporting the uh, critical raw, raw material supply chain. Belfast as a location, um, also probably you know, not, not quite well understood at the moment, is the, the role that Belfast Harbour is going to play in the rollout of offshore wind. Um, it is the largest harbour in the UK um, with the ability and the infrastructure to support the rollout. And, uh, you know, we do see a huge opportunity for the development of, off, uh, to development of both offshore wind and the complementary um, recycling of end-of-life assets from the repowering um, in the UK, both onshore and offshore, that is expected to commence towards the end of this decade. Finally, I'm just going to leave you with the value proposition. Um, we do see the business having a number of um, clear opportunities and advantages over a number of peers in the supply chain. We do have, obviously, immediate exposure now to the magnet rare earth supply chain and, and pricing with both the production of high purity oxides in Belfast and shortly to start production of mixed rare earth carbonate in Uganda. Um, with the ionic, uh, ionic technologies and the recycling, you know, that entry into the circular economy of magnet rare earths is an area that's got tremendous appeal from the supply chain 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, earlier, a lot of diverse inquiry coming from the OEMs now looking to add um, sustainably sourced magnet rare earths into their existing supply chain and their plans going forward. Um, if we look at Makutu in a bit more detail, it's a very large asset. It will get larger. We've already defined a potential 35-year life with the extension uh, potential with uh, five other tenements that will progress to mining licences in the near term. Um, it is a low capital development producing those elements of the supply chain wants. It's producing both magnet and heavy rare earths. So from a geopolitically sensitive um, market driven by policy uh, and the potential bifurcation of supply chains, we do see ourselves being an early mover in this space. Um, and then finally, the, the company continues to explore the ability to further value add uh, the Makutu, raw, uh, Makutu rare earth basket through development of our own refinery, and we continue to work on that um, to, to identify the best locations for the company to, to develop that asset. And so with that, uh, Michael, that's that's the, the rundown of the story and, and open to some questions. Uh, sorry, sorry. Can we just do that? Sorry, just starting to get my video open. Thank you very much for the team. That was a really good wrap and um, uh, appreciate your time today. Look, we've got a couple of questions we can squeeze in before uh, the 20 minutes is up. I'll just start with, there's a couple of questions in the general sort of ideas that we're going, excuse my doorbell ringing in the background there. Uh, perfect timing. Um, does does uh, does Ionic require 100% of the land acquisition to get the mining licence approval or can they get it done with the 90, 95%? Yeah, so this has been a bit of a moving feast for us. Um, we've been engaging with the Ugandan government. Um, we've been told now that 95% is more than adequate now to satisfy the requirements for the mining licence. Having hosted the, the, the team from the DGSM on site and completed the verification process, you know, tremendous feedback, positive feedback from the DGSM. And so, uh, yeah, now being in a position to move forward. So we're, we're awaiting the, the award of the mining licence now. And, and look, there was another couple of just questions, and I'm trying to sort of combine them into one. And uh, what's your just your view on the timing on things that, on that front? Good question, Michael. I mean, I've been waiting a long time. I'm a very patient man, but patience is yeah being tested through this process. You know, we're working with the Uganda government to make sure. I mean, this is the first major mining license that's been awarded under the new Act and the regulations. Um, so working closely with them, we expect it to come through very, very shortly. You know, we're building the demonstration plant now. You know, there's a number of other things that are moving quite positive with regards to the project. So we do have a very strong support from the Ugandan government. Um, and so whilst I appreciate everybody's patience is being tested, uh, we do expect that ML to come through shortly. That's that. That's good. Let's uh, let's hope that uh, we can see that. It's obviously a very key key sort of uh, catalyst for the for the stock moving forward, isn't it? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll just, we're just about there to the 20 minute mark. I'll just uh, throw one more uh, at you, which is about your broad funding options. Can you just give us a little bit of a, a little bit of a, just a review on that one? Yeah, so given where we are in the supply chain and the critical importance of this material into sovereign capability across the US, Europe, Japan, Korea, to name but a few markets, there is uh, significant interest from strategic parties, um, so potential strategic partners to come in um, and help us develop the site, develop the project in order to get our mixed rare earth carbonate from Makutu into those um, advanced manufacturing environments. So, you know, we've been running a strategic partnering process for some time. Um, we've been talking with a lot of groups globally. Um, key to this is understanding where the product's going to go in the supply chain and that then creates the avenue for the strategic partners to come in. Um, we are waiting on, on a number of catalysts there. Obviously, the mining licence is, is a big step for us, but also production of mixed rare earth carbonate in the new year, we do see as being, again, two big catalysts that enable us to move forward. And I think the other thing that's important is to be able to speak for more than 60% of the asset. So you know, at the moment, we own 60% of Makutu. We've been in discussions with our partners for some time. And hopefully in the near term, we're able to um, to, to, to clean up the ownership. Um, and again, these are key, key milestones for us to be able to engage with the supply chain. Excellent. Well, that's great, Tim. Thank you very much for your time today. And uh, my apologies if I didn't get to all the questions today, but we'll have a look at them and make sure that Tim gets those questions uh, in the next day or two. So 
Once again, Tim, very much appreciate your time and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And we're now going to go on to our next, uh, our next speaker uh, from... Um, Recording stopped.